think I'm supposed to help you. Okay. That's why I think it's time for you to move on. Wait, look. Take that. Take the weekend. And just think about it, okay? Can I help you? I, uh... I actually think I'm supposed to help you. You got an action. I'd say it was just me telling myself I'm just a hobbyist. I wasn't good enough to share it with others. It is the little things, Scott. The things we tuck away that can make an impact. Can you teach me? Where would you like to start? I'm learning so much. Something that I took away for so long is now being poured into by someone I just met. And I have, I have you to thank. Sounds like you had quite the weekend. Yes. <laughs> yes, I did. There was always more in you, Scott. I'm excited to see what comes of it. What do you think? Edges are a little rough, but the shape is right. In a little while, I think we'll be onto something. <laughs> no peeking. Uh, okay. Okay, no peeking. <laughs> All right, we're the front of the couch. Okay. Down just a little bit. There you oh. go. A little bit more, and then turn. There you okay. go. Okay. Okay. You ready? Yes, yeah, Scott. Here we go. Open them, you can open them. Well, what do you think? It's the true north. And that's the name that I've been kicking around for a minute, but I incorporated the compass, I incorporated the rose as well. There are so many people that need homes, and there are grants out there for people like us. So I was thinking that we could build these houses for, for people in need, and, and, and a lot of people that need help, we can do it. It's non-profit. Beautiful rose for the beautiful lady. For me. Mm. Oh, you should. I think that this could be something special. I know it will be. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, let's take a second. Let's, let's welcome our family in from local as well as global. We got Italy, Colombia, and Zimbabwe and everywhere in between with us today. So come on, let's just welcome everybody one more time. Uh, anybody ever had a bad day? Yep, 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 yep. Anybody ever had a bad day that turned into a bad decade? <laughs> and like maybe the 90s weren't that hot and then like the 2000s came and right when everything was like coming together like COVID like pulled the rug out from underneath your feet and maybe you're even in here today or you're watching online and you're kind of just left shrugging your shoulders wondering how in the world can God make sense of all this right like where am I going and maybe you've been clued in with us over the last few weeks as we're talking about living true north about living a life of purpose on purpose and you've heard us define purpose. And I'm hopefully I'm drilling this into your mind. So if I was to say my purpose is what, what would you say? My purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. One more time. My purpose is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And my purpose is different than my calling because my calling is how I specifically individually do that. 
Like, how do I use my gifts, my passion, and my story to glorify God and to enjoy him wherever I am? So uh, with work, with career, with home, with relationships, if it's being a stay-at-home mom, an architect, an author, uh, an artist, an engineer, in government, whatever it is, how do I use who I am to glorify God and enjoy him forever? And that's our calling. And, And maybe you've kind of been listening over the last few weeks, and there's just this thing inside you that says, yeah, like that's great for everybody else, right? Come on, like I know everybody else has a purpose, everybody else has a calling, but I'm not sure about me. You know, those are the mind games that we play because when I was younger, I had a dream. When I was younger, I felt a direction. When I was younger, I felt a calling, but there's almost like too much life underneath the bridge. I feel like I've messed up too much. I lost my way, whatever it is. And I'm just kind of left struggling like, I don't even know if I have a calling or where do I go from here? And here's the thought for today, guys. Maybe we've lost sight of the fact that there is a process to living on purpose. There is a process to living on purpose. So if you've ever felt like you're spinning your wheels, if you've ever felt like I have no clue where I'm going, where am I supposed to go from here? Today is for you. So I want to introduce you to our friend for the day, and his name is Joseph. All right, so we're going to learn some from Joseph today. Not New Testament Joseph, like Jesus's dad. We're going to learn from Old Testament Joseph. And you're like, I didn't even know there was one. That's why we read the whole Bible. Okay, so Abraham, if you, if you know kind of the lineage, Abraham had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had a son named Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, woo, from multiple women. That's a whole different sermon. <laughs> but his 11th son was his favorite son, and his name was Joseph. In fact, he loved Joseph so much that he made him an amazing Technicolor dream coat. Broadway picked up on a few years back. Um, now, here's the, here's the problem that begins to develop is that Joseph was his dad's favorite. Now, I know like his siblings were all like, oh, I don't know, I think dad likes him more, right? And we're kind of kidding. Um, well, his dad wasn't. Jacob told everybody, I hate you guys. I really like Joseph. <laughs> and so his brothers hated Joseph for it. And to make it worse, really the first time we find Joseph, uh, he's out, he's a shepherd, he's out in the pasture and his brothers are out there with him shepherding and apparently they aren't doing it very well because he goes back to snitch on them to his dad, which makes it so much worse. And then we catch up with the story, Genesis 37, verse five, Joseph had a dream. How many of you ever had a dream before? right? Come on, like either just a dream in the night or a dream to do something, right? A dream to accomplish something great, a dream to go in a certain direction. And here's the problem though, is that Joseph wakes up and he's like, I know what I'm going to do. Hey, family, I had a dream last night. And now here's what happened in my dream. Uh, We were all out in the field collecting wheat and we tied our wheat together and my wheat stood up tall and all of your wheat bowed down to my wheat, And everybody's eating their cereal and is like. (laughs) And Joseph found out very early is that not everybody cares about your calling. Right? Come on. Not everybody's going to desire your dream the same way that you do. So you better be careful when you share your dream before it's time with people who aren't able to handle the weight of your dream. And in that setting, maybe you've had the thought before of like, hey, I'm gonna kill my brother. And you weren't really serious. They were. And so Joseph's brothers decide to kill Joseph. It's going bad. So what they do, they grab Joseph, they lure him out, they beat him up, they throw him into a pit and they're about to leave him for dead. But then they're like, wait a second, I can make some money on this guy. So they sell Joseph into slavery. And just think about this, okay? Just a few hours before, Joseph is his family's darling. Like he's the, he's dad's favorite. He's out in the pasture. Things couldn't go better. He's having dreams. And now all of a sudden he's been beat up, thrown into a pit, and he's being sold off into slavery, shackled ankle to ankle, arm to arm with other, other people being sold into a foreign land like that. And the slave traders take him off to Egypt right, kind of the seat of power in the world at that time, and they sell him into the house of a man named Potiphar. Now, this is kind of divine design because Potiphar wasn't just any man. Potiphar was Pharaoh's bodyguard, 
All right, so Pharaoh was the most powerful man in the entire world, and so they sell Joseph into the household of Potiphar. And then we catch this really interesting verse, Genesis 39, verse two, the Lord was with Joseph. (laughs) No, he's not. Come on, go with, I know we're in church. I know we're in church. Pretend like you're not in church. There's no way God is with Joseph, right? Because that's not how it works. If God was really with Joseph, Joseph would be back home and his brothers would be the ones who are in slavery because we all know that nothing ever goes bad in the lives of people who love God (laughs) and are called according to his purpose for them. Bless the Lord, everything's great. It's all sunshine and unicorns, right? In verse three, when his master saw that the Lord was with Joseph and that the Lord Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in Potiphar's eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his entire household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. And from the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. Come on, guys, be a little irreverent with me just for a second. If I'm Joseph, I'm like, okay, God, time out, time out. You're blessing him because of me? How about you bless me because of me? (laughs) And get me out of here. How are you blessing him because of me? This isn't how it's supposed to work. And if you know the story, it goes from bad to worse because over in the corner, you hear a, yoo-hoo, Joseph. And it's thirst trap, Potiphar's wife, starts hitting on Joseph and wants to have an affair with him. And now Joseph is put in an absolute no-win situation, right? Because here's the the reality. Either Joseph disobeys God, has an affair, sleeps with Potiphar, you know, Potiphar's uh, uh, wife, and Potiphar has him killed, or or he disobeys God, or he obeys God, sorry, and and says no to Potiphar's wife, and she has him killed. So he's gonna die either way. So what do you do, Joseph? Verse eight, he says this to Potiphar's wife. With me in charge, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except for you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph, you mean that God who's been so good to you? Come on, Joseph, you mean that God who allowed you to be ripped away from your family, beat up, thrown into a pit, marched off into slavery and sold into Potiphar's house and put in a no-win situation? Joseph, Joseph, come on, Joseph, how in the world are you gonna be faithful to a God who hasn't been faithful to you? And it's right here that Joseph deals with all of our rationalizing of sin. Come on, my wife didn't do this, so I did that. Come on, God didn't do this thing for me, so I did that. Even when there's no evidence of God anywhere around, Joseph still obeys God. How in the world do you do that? Why? Why did Joseph obey? How in the world does somebody who's been ripped away from their family, beat up, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, marched off to Potiphar's house, and then put in a no-win situation still choose to obey because Joseph believed that God was still God good, and that God was still leading him somewhere good, even though he couldn't see it with his own eyes, and he had no clue how he was going to get there. So Joseph obeyed God, chose purity, and ran away from Potiphar's wife. And do you remember how Joseph is rewarded for his faithfulness? He's framed for rape, and then Potiphar throws him into the dungeon, Verse 20, but while Joseph was there in the prison, mm, 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 mm. come on, just go with me, come on, come on. I don't want the Lord to be with me in prison (laughs) because I don't want to be in prison. Like, I want the Lord to be with me in Hawaii. Come on, I want the Lord to be with me in Fiji. I want the Lord to be with me in the corner office. You know what I'm saying? But in prison, I don't want to be in prison. 
But what does the Lord do? He showed him kindness, and he granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. You guys, just pause again. If you are writing your story, and the best part of your story is that you're best friends with a prison warden, <laughs> your story's not going the direction you thought it would. Right? Like, nobody writes that part into their story. Hey, I was framed for rape, and now me and the warden, we're like on a first-name basis. Like, it's awesome, right? I'm go I'm, this is when I was a little kid. Like, I dreamed of this day, right? No. It's, what do you do with that? What do you do when your life doesn't make sense? What, is it, what do you do when all of a sudden you find yourself in the prison? What do you do with this? But God was inching Joseph's story forward. And we find it here in verse 22. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. Are you starting to notice a theme? Promotion, promotion, promotion. It doesn't make sense. All of a sudden, Joseph is leading things wherever he goes. And if the cliff notes here, here of this part is, while he's in prison, um, somebody who works for Pharaoh, his cupbearer, right? Somebody really close to the most powerful man in the world, the cupbearer is thrown into prison, so he did something bad. And while he's there, uh, he has a dream. And Joseph, God gives Joseph the ability to interpret the cupbearer's dream. And here's the condition, though. He says, hey, listen, the interpretation is this. You're about to get set free. You're gonna go. But when you go, tell people about me. I'm innocent. I should not be here. When you leave, when you get set free, tell people that I'm here so that I could be set free. But when he leaves, the cupbearer forgets about Joseph. And he sits in prison for two days more years. And at this point, Joseph has been in this crazy journey for one year, two, three, four, five, 13 years. 13 years of just chaos. And then one day, Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the entire world, has a dream and nobody can interpret it. So he's like, I'm about to kill everybody. And then the cupbearer's like, Oh, wait a second, I remember this guy. He's in your prison. We should go get him. So they take Joseph, they shower him up, like they get him presentable, they put him in front of Pharaoh. And, and Pharaoh says, here's the dream. Can you interpret it? Now here's the reality. Joseph, don't mess this up, bro. This is your one shot. Do everything exactly right. Now here it is, Genesis 41, 16. I cannot do it. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Come on, guys. Joseph says that he can't interpret the dream, but God can. How was he able to say that? How is somebody who's been ripped away from their family, beat up, thrown into a pit, sold into slavery, placed in a pot of her house, framed for rape, rotted in the dungeon for years, now finds himself standing in front of the most powerful person in the world? How is he able to say, God will do it? Because he believed that God was still good even though his circumstances were not. And in the highs and the lows, God was still sovereign and God was still taking Joseph inch by inch by inch where he wanted him to go. So God gives Joseph the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream. Here in 41, 41, Pharaoh says to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt because I've known you for five minutes. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger and he dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck like Tupac. And he had him ride in a chariot as his second in command and men shouted before him, make way, here comes Joseph. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt and then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh but without your word no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. And we see that and we're like, well, yeah, now God's with them. Yeah, now it's obvious that God is with them. But we have this perspective, right? That God has always been with them. Come on, somebody. Joseph went from the pit to the palace seemingly overnight. But we know it wasn't overnight. We know there was a process we know there was a journey that had its high points and a lot of low points, but inch by inch by inch, God was moving Joseph's life. Rewind, from the pasture to the pit, to Potiphar's, to the prison, to Pharaoh, to the palace. 
And there were certain things that Joseph, I'd say it like this, that Joseph had to persist in, in the process as he moved in purpose from the pit to the palace. And I do that because I'm a preacher. I say it a lot of peace. <laughs> the calling on Joseph's life required a God-ordained development process. And the calling on your life requires the same. A God-ordained development process. So, like Joseph, through the high times, the bad times, the low times, the good times, the bad times, when it doesn't look like our story is going anywhere, how do we persist in purpose from the pit to the palace? Let's say, like, let's personalize it. So repeat after me. How do I, how do I persist in purpose? Persist. How do I persist in purpose. Here's the first thing. I have to be faithful in the now. I have to be faithful in the now. This is one of the trickiest parts of our calling, okay? Because what happens is you start to get a sense of what you're called to, like Joseph getting the dream, right? Of his bundle of wheat standing up and everybody else is bowing down. And what you're tempted to do is drop everything that you have right now and move forward into the next right? Our temptation is to focus on the next instead of being faithful with now. Let me say it again. Our temptation is to focus on the next instead of being faithful with the now. And we don't understand that you'll never get next unless you're faithful with the now. This might be the word of the Lord for some of you guys. You'll never get the next unless you're faithful with the now. And this is, this is one of the traps of youth, especially because a lot of young people want what their parents have without working the way that their parents did to get what they have, right? You want it now. It's my money and I want it now. Too many people want the payout without the payment. Too many people want the promotion without paying the price, but God is saying, no, 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 no. I'm a God of process. I'm a God of development. And if you're looking for the cheat code for promotion, it's faithfulness. Faithfulness. Be faithful with now. Listen, Joseph had a dream as a teenager, right? But it was 13 years before he saw that dream come to pass. Just because you know what you're going to do does not mean that you don't have to be faithful in the meantime. Listen, Joseph was faithful in the pasture. Joseph was faithful in Potiphar's house. Joseph, Joseph was faithful in the prison before he ever made it to the palace. Listen, let, let, let me paint the picture. Joseph is not in the prison like, mm, I shouldn't be here. I ain't working today. I shouldn't even be here. I should be back home. <laughs> right? Come on, if I could set up a camera in your office Monday morning, or the fact that you don't have an office, I don't know, wherever you are, right? Would you be like, I shouldn't be here. I should be way further ahead than I am right now. Everybody's overlooking me. I should be way promoted beyond this. I'm not even, I'm not even gonna work anymore. I mean, I'm not even work anymore. <laughs> now, Joseph's working in the prison, and apparently he's working so well that he's catching the attention of everybody. Let me say it like this. Can you be faithful in the pit when there's no sight of the palace? Even when the palace is a dream, even when the palace is like, I don't even know if that was a promise. Maybe it was just a dream I had one day. No, can you be faithful in the pit when there's no, no sight of the palace? And I see this all the time, guys. Some people come up to me at the door, if this is you, God bless you. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about the other guy. <laughs> but they're like, hey, pastor, I'm, I'm gonna start a ministry. And I want to be like, bro, you don't even pastor your own house. People at work don't even know you're a Christian. And you're going to start a ministry? Oh, no, no, I'm about to be the boss of this place. Bro, you don't even show up on time. Oh, no, 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 I'll show up on time when I get the promotion. No, you won't. You won't get that promotion until you start showing up on time. Oh, but I, I was prophesied over when I was a kid. Yeah, and the same God who prophesied over you says you need to show up on time. <laughs> the same God who prophesied over you says, hey, if you're ever gonna advance in your calling, you gotta stop smoking weed every day. You can have all the gifts in the world. 
all the gifts in the world, but if you aren't faithful with them, you'll never step forward into your calling. And you'll end up wandering around in the desert for 40 years. And God's saying, I got one test for you, but you keep failing it. So you gotta keep taking it over and over and over and over and over again. You're wandering around out here in the desert. Can you, can you say no to that sin? Can you say no to that person? Can you say no to that idol? Can, whatever it is. And we just keep wandering around, wandering around. God's calling us to be faithful so that when the next door opens up, we can move forward. Jesus says it like this, Luke 16. Luke 16, 12. He says, and if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Right? Because before David was king of Israel, right, he was a shepherd. And David wasn't out there in the field be like, hey, hey, when they give me the promotion, that's when I'll take care, better care of sheep. God was like, no, 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 that's not how it works. In fact, I see the way that you take care of sheep and you do it so well that I know I can trust you with people. Because if you aren't faithful with sheep, you definitely won't be faithful with people. Because how you handle the little things determines how you handle the big things. Can you be faithful with today so that God can trust you with tomorrow? So what does all that mean? Colossians 3, 23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. What that means is, at the end of the day, your boss is not your boss. Jesus is your boss, all right? That guy, that girl, that system, whatever it is, they ain't your boss, all right? Jesus is your boss. So you're, you're not showing up based on how they treat you. You're showing up as if Jesus is running the place because he is. And I wanna represent him. Well, I'm gonna glorify God and enjoy him in the process. Listen, even if I hate my job. So how do I, I be faithful with now? So listen, you may be an insurance salesman and you're like, this is terrible. I hate this job. Okay, in this season, what does it look like to be a faithful insurance salesman who glorifies God and enjoys him right where I am. Listen, some of you are students and you can't wait to graduate. Well, the problem is while you're just waiting to graduate, your whole class is waiting for somebody to tell them about Jesus, Amen. right? And we're just burning time. And God's saying, can you be faithful exactly right where you are? So the question is this, how do I thrive right where I am? How do I squeeze every lesson out of this season? so that I'm ready to step into the next. Because I don't wanna be so future focused that I neglect what God wants to do in me and through me today. I wanna be faithful with today so God can trust me with tomorrow. So how do I persist in the process of purpose? I have to be faithful with today. Here's the second thing. I have to grow in the dark. I have to grow in the dark. One of the most important things that we can do on our journey of living in purpose is to grow when no one's watching. Can you grow when the lights are not? Can you grow when nobody's monitoring you, making sure you do it? Can you grow when the lights are off? Guys, think about it like this. Joseph, maybe Joseph knew it or maybe not, um, but Joseph's gift, yes, he, had, he could interpret dreams, yes, but his natural gift was administration. He was a really good manager. He was a leader. Why? Because anything he touched got better, right? Where did he start? He started on the hillside, leading his sheep, right? Because he was like, hey, brothers, y'all aren't doing it right. In fact, you're not listening to me. I'm gonna go tell dad. Now, he didn't do it well, right? He was really bad at it at first, but there was this budding gift, right? It was just starting to grow, right? And so now that gift of administration gets put over into Potiphar's house, and now it moves from a pasture, from a hillside, just a handful of sheep. Now it moves to a whole hillside. Now it's not sheep, now it's people, right? And he does it so well, and that, that, that gift is maturing, that gift is developing, that gift is growing, right? When the lights aren't on, like he's not on a platform, nobody's looking at Joseph, but Potiphar sees it, right? And then all of a sudden he's in the prison, and now he's, he's actually on the radar of the guy who's leading the prison. So listen, now it's not a handful of sheep, now it's not one hand, household. Now it's actually like a whole prison system, Right, he's growing, he's maturing, he's developing. So by the time he gets in front of Pharaoh and, God, and he puts him over the whole palace, over the whole country, Joseph didn't just show up there by accident. Joseph had actually been growing in the dark for decades. 
So when he's, when he's running the whole country, he does it well. Why? Because he started growing on the hillside. And let me say it like this, guys. You'll never get to the palace if you don't grow in the pit. You'll never get to the palace if you don't grow in the pit. Everybody looks at gifted people and they're like, man, if I had just been born like that, I could do what they do. If I, if I had only been given those gifts, I could do what they do. And what we do is we fail to see is, listen, that person wasn't born like that. Yes, they had gifts. Yes, they had a passion. Yes, they've had a story just like you. Just like you. Yeah, maybe it's different gifts. Maybe it's a different passion. Maybe it's a different story. But listen, what they did, they were faithful to grow over the decades. So what you see is not them just waking up, rolling out of bed and doing something amazing. No, they actually matured that gift in the dark when nobody was watching. And here's the spiritual principle, okay, that Jesus shares with us. Matthew 6, 6. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you in public. Right, Because God is really big on what you do when nobody's watching. Are you maturing in the dark? Are you growing in the dark? Or are you waiting to be on a platform? And that's when you're like, okay, that's when I'll take it seriously. God says, can you grow in the dark? Listen, for me, my, my own personal story. I knew I would never make it in ministry if I didn't grow. Right? Because listen, I have a geography degree from the University of Georgia. That is not exactly the bedrock of a ministry calling. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it's not like that's what Billy Graham did. And so I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go make maps, you know? Like, no, like they, I, I'm not negating a geography degree, okay? But it's not exactly the trajectory of a ministry calling, like a full-time ministry pastor and calling, right? So while I was working my nine to five and I became a small group leader, I know, I don't know what I'm doing. So I have to start reading voraciously. Like, you should see my, 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 my office, like, covered in books. Why? Because I, I didn't go to school for this stuff. Like, I got to grow. Like, I got to take my growth seriously. I got to learn how to lead a small group, right? The first time I preached my sermon, I put way too much work into that. Like, the first sermon in a retirement home full of people who aren't even listening. <laughs> Just over there in their own world, right? You know, but I took it seriously. I knew I had to grow. I had to work on my soul in the meantime. Come on, somebody. I put my life out in front of a handful of men who are way down the road from me, way more mature in ministry, way more mature in life, way, way longer married, way more than I have, right? Why? Because I knew this. I knew this. I knew it's possible for your gifts to take you to a place where your character cannot keep you. And in fact, I think that's what Paul is writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy when he says, hey, be careful about promoting somebody too fast or else they're gonna fall into the devil's trap. I believe the devil's trap is this. I believe the devil's trap is taking somebody because of their gifts and giving them influence, but their character cannot keep them there. And so they're promoted beyond their character. Then people are looking at them. They have a public fall and everybody says, yeah, see, that's why I don't follow Jesus. And what I didn't ever want for, to be in, true in my life is for somebody to be able to look at my fall and be like, see, that's why I don't follow Jesus. So I said, God, grow me in the dark so I can actually survive in the light. Because I don't want my gifts to take me to a place where my character cannot keep me. So I had to put my life in front of other men who could hold me accountable, who could say, bro, bro like that's the wrong trajectory for your life. I had to grow in the dark. I had to go to leadership meetings. I had, I had to grow in leadership. I had to stick my nose in the scriptures. So much prayer, fasting. Uh, back in the day, we had a ministry school here, which is part of what we're trying to reboot. Prayer, be in prayer for us. Next year, we want to reboot the, the ministry school here at Victory. I went through the ministry school back in the day. Um, you've heard me share it there. I think it was 2000, uh, beginning of 2005. I was the, um, I was the, the pastor of the English speaking side of a Korean Baptist church right down the road. Right. So I would come here on Saturdays when we had Saturday night service. And then I would go and preach there on Sundays. Then we would have a potluck because that's just what you do in the Korean church. Right. And so I got to taste all that food because why did I do it? Cause I didn't like victory. No, I knew I was called to victory. I did it because I was only preaching about like once a quarter. And I was like, listen, there's a, I know there's a big difference in preaching once every 12 weeks and preaching every week. So I gotta go get reps when nobody's watching. Is there a place I can go and grow? So I went there and I grew in the dark and all that's before I ever came on staff. Because I knew I had to grow my character 
I had to grow in my gifts when nobody was watching. And so what happened was God was able to promote me and trust me from a small group leader to a small, actually a small group apprentice to a small group leader to a small group coach to the pastor of Fusion to a pastor of Hamilton Mill. And then leading into 2019, I was praying about the year and God said, hey, I want you to spend this whole year getting as healthy as you possibly can. And that was the year leading into Summer and I receiving the torch to be the senior pastors here. And guys, I cannot be clear enough about this. It is what you do when no one's watching that prepares you to be who everyone sees. It is what you do when no one is watching and the lights are not on and the Instagram feed isn't, isn't scrolling, right? When there's no live feed of anything, when your family's not around, when it's just you and Jesus, it is what you do when no one is watching that prepares you to be who everyone sees. So here's the question. What do I need to do today to grow in the dark so God can promote me in the light? What do I need to do when nobody's watching so that God can promote me to this place that everybody sees and what they see is what they get? It's not me wearing a mask. It's not just because of my gifts, but my character can actually sustain me in the place where my gifts got me. And I don't know what that means for you. I don't know how you grow in the dark. Some of you need to start leading at home. Some of you need to start leading in here. You need to start serving, giving. I don't know what it is. What do you need to do to start growing in the dark so God can promote you in the light? So if we're ever gonna persist in purpose, right? We have to be faithful in the now. We have to grow in the dark. And here's the last thing. We have to be patient in the process. We have to be patient. Here's the most important part about walking in your calling. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't abort the process. A vast majority of people press the eject button an inch too soon. It's like if you've ever seen that drawing before, right? It's like the the guy digging and he's one pickaxe blow away from discovering the diamond but he gets frustrated, he gets tired, he's worn out, and he just gives up and walks away. Like like, like the angel when he came to Daniel and he said, hey, you've been praying for 21 days, but if you gave up on day 20, I wouldn't even be here. You gotta keep persisting. Are you gonna be patient? Are you gonna keep going? Listen, single moms, don't give up. Listen, business entrepreneurs, don't give up. Come on, I know it feels like the water's coming in. Listen, I know you may feel like you're in the pit right now. Don't give up. You might feel like you're in prison, unwarranted, unjustified. You are framed. People shouldn't even be talking smack about you. Don't give up. Don't give up. Because God is moving you inch by inch by inch from the pasture to the pit to Potiphar's to prison to Pharaoh to the palace. And if you're ever going to get to the palace, you first must learn to be patient in the pit. If you're ever going to get there, you have to learn to be patient, even in the valley of the shadow. Can you be patient when you look around and it seems like God has forsaken you? Can you be patient when God has given you a dream and you look around and you're like, did I just, did I just think that? Was that even God? I, I've shared this before. I shared this at the beginning of the year. God gave me the million person mission for victory in 2011, but I wasn't the senior pastor. What did I do with that, right? I knew this. I knew if I just dropped everything and went out and did that and I wasn't faithful in the now, I was hopeless. I can't do that. I knew that if I did, with the gift set that I had, if I just charged out and did that, I know I can't can't carry that weight. So what I had to do was I just said, well, I guess I I just gotta pray. I gotta be faithful in the now. I gotta grow in the dark. And I have to be patient in the process because if God actually gave that mission to me, then he's gonna be the one who opens up the doors that I can walk through. Because I believe he can open up doors that no man can open. He shuts the doors that no man can close. And if he actually gave me that mission, if he actually gave me that dream, I gotta do what I do. And then as he opens up the doors, I'm gonna walk through them. I can't make it happen. Listen, 2011, that was 10 years No, that was nine years before Summer and I ever even stepped into our role here as senior pastors. And listen, I don't know if you noticed, we're not in a million people yet. I mean, I don't know if you noticed that, right? (laughs) We're just scratching the surface of it. And so sometimes a God-given dream 
takes a maturity, a maturation process that demands patience. But I believe this for you. I believe this for you. Philippians 1.6. I am certain that the God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished. But here's the bad news, guys. It will only be finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So in other words, you're not gonna be like 19 and be like, I have arrived. I am now finished. (laughs) It's just coasting from here. No, come on. God will lead you from glory to glory to glory to glory. But what we have to do is be faithful in the now. We have to grow in the dark. We have to be patient in the process. And then when God opens up the doors, we walk through them. Because he's a good shepherd and he's gonna lead us and guide us all the way home. Joseph had a hundred opportunities to give up, to say, God hasn't been faithful to me. I'm not gonna be faithful to him. I give up, whatever it is, right? But Joseph trusted that God was at work, even in the pit, even in the prison, all the way to the palace, inch by inch. And if we fast forward the story all the way to the end, let's see how the story with Joseph ends. Um, A famine hits the land, right? And uh, the only nation that's actually prepared for it is Egypt. Why? Because Joseph was running the place. And Joseph has a gift that he was operating in, he was running in, and he actually had been faithful with it, so he was given the position to influence an entire nation because of his gift. And so the whole surrounding world is coming to Egypt to get food from Egypt, and it eventually gets to the place that Joseph's family runs out of food. And so Jacob sends the brothers to go to Egypt to go get food. And anybody who comes to Egypt to get food has to stand before Joseph. Now, here's the problem. His brothers don't know that Joseph is even still alive, right? They think he's, he's dead in a pit somewhere. He's sold, like he's sitting he's in slavery, whatever. And they come and they stand before Joseph and they don't recognize him. And, and when Joseph says, hey, surprise, they're all like, oh, no. Because <laughs> they know the last time they sold Joseph and they're thinking eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. This thing's about to go bad, But it's in Genesis 50, 20 that Joseph says this. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Can you see the perspective? How beautiful of a perspective is that? Listen, I know you guys had your intention, but God had a better intention. You guys thought you were killing me. God was actually guiding me. You thought you were bringing me here? God's the one who brought me here. Come on, God's the one who brought me to this position. Listen, when when Joseph was in the pit, it didn't make sense. When Joseph was in Potiphar's, it didn't make sense. When Joseph was in prison, it didn't make sense. When Joseph was standing before Pharaoh, it didn't make sense. But when Joseph is standing there in the middle of his calling... And when he stands up tall and his childhood dream comes true and all of his brothers bow down, he's able to see, God put me here. God put me here. He orchestrated my story. And I wouldn't change any of it. Now, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy either. (laughs) Because it was terrible. I had to go through the pit be framed for rape, thrown in prison for 13, 14, 15 years to get to this place, but I wouldn't change any of it because it made me who I am. It is now my story, and now my life is a blessing to other people, and I'm standing right in the middle of my calling. Why? Because I was faithful in the now, I grew in the dark, and I was patient in the process. And that is my prayer for you guys, the victory that this house, we would persist in our purpose. And through the highs and the lows, the ups and the downs, inch by inch, we would trust that God is still good and God is leading us someplace good. And our next step is to be faithful in the now, to grow in the dark, and to be patient in the process. All for the glory of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hey guys, let's do this. Let's bow our heads. Let's, Let's take a second. Let's just pray here in this moment. Father, probably our our biggest prayer that we could pray right here is that we trust you. We trust you. We wanna walk by faith and not by sight. And so 
God, lots of times when we look at our life and we look at our story and, and there are moments where it makes sense, but lots of times it doesn't. We don't know how we got to where we are. Maybe we do. Maybe, maybe we look at, man, I just keep failing that test over and over and over again. But God, here's our, here's our ultimate statement of faith. God, we trust that the one who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion. That you have not abandoned us, you have not forsaken us, and if you are for us, who can be against us? So we trust our lives into the hands of a good shepherd. And God, even for those of us today, God, who are walking through the valley of the shadow, God, I trust that you are not leading us to the valley. You're leading us through the valley to the mountaintops. You will not abandon us in the pit because you were with Joseph. You will not abandon us in Potiphar's house because you were with Joseph. You will not abandon us in the prison because you were with Joseph. God, wherever we are, at whatever season of life, there's some of us today who are in the pasture. It's good, it's good. Man, it's small. Our, our place in life is small, but it's good. There's others of us, we're in the pit. Others of us, we're in Potiphar's place. Others of us, we're being framed. Others of us, we're in the prison. It just does not look good. Some of us are actually in the palace. We feel like we're running in our calling. That's awesome. But wherever we are, God, we trust you. We trust you. And God, I believe this. I believe that process, this developmental process, is the incubator of our gifts of our callings, God, that you're developing something special on the inside of us, through our gifts, our passion, and our story. And I, I, I pray this for us, Father. I pray this over victory. I pray this over this family. God, that we would be faithful in the now. God, that we wouldn't be so focused on next that we're not faithful in the now. God, show us what it looks like to be faithful in school, to be faithful in work, to be faithful at home. God, I pray that you would show us what it looks like to be faithful spouses. What does it look like to be faithful in our marriage? God, what does it look like to faithfully raise our kids up in the way of the Lord? What does it look like to faithfully work as unto the Lord? What does, it, what does it look like for us to be faithful, for us to be known by our faithfulness? And God, I'm praying over us that we would then go and that we would grow in the dark. God, we wouldn't wait for that one day when we get the promotion or whatever it is. God, we would be growing today so we're ready when that door opens to step into the next season. God, I pray that you would give us the, the determination to grow when nobody's watching. And I pray over us, Father, especially those of us who are struggling today, God, that we would not grow weary in doing good. But God, we would be patient in the process. God, we would say yes every day. Even when I don't understand, I say yes. God, that we would not abandon your plans for us. Because I believe, God, we're right there and that you are taking us inch by inch into a good story because you're a good father who cares about your kids. God, I believe that you are leading us from glory to glory to glory to glory. For some of us, for some of us in the pit, it's glorious because you're leading us through it. God, for some of us in prison, God, it's glorious because you're leading us through it. We trust your leadership. We submit to your leadership. In fact, let's just do this. Come on, before we close, let's lift up our hands to the Lord. God, this is our sign of surrender. Saying, God, we're not gonna try and manhandle the plans. Here's our real prayer. God, that you would give us ears to hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying. God, that you would lead us forward as a good shepherd. God, I pray over our hearts that we would submit to your leadership, that we would be faithful in the now, that we would grow in the dark, and that we would be patient in the process. Right now, I bless your people in the name of Jesus. I thank you for the saving grace of God and found in the blood of Jesus Christ. God, that we are set free by grace through faith. We are sons and daughters of the living God, and you have called us to rule and reign as kings in life. So everybody who has their heads down, God, I pray that you would show them that they are seated with Christ in heavenly places, that you are for them, not against them. You have plans for them to prosper them and give them a hope and a future. And because you are a good God, you are taking us to a good place from glory to glory to glory. I bless your sons and daughters today. And I say, let your kingdom come and let your will be done in and through our lives as we persist in purpose here on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. And everybody said,
Amen, amen, amen. Let's glory to God.